को जश्न बहारा है इश्क ये देख के हैरा है कहने को जश्न बहारा है इश्क ये देख के हैरा है फूल से खुशबू खफा खफा है गुलशन में छुपा है कोई रंज फिजा के चिलमन में सारे सहम नजारे हैं सोए सोए वक्त के खारे हैं और दिल में कोई कोई सी बातें हैं ओ कहने को जश्न बहारा है इश्क के देख के हैरा है कहने को जश्न बहारा है इश्क के देख के हैरा है फूल से खुशबू खफा खफा है गुलशन में
everyone, and welcome to our second reconvene session of 2023. My name is Alex Gallinari. I am a brand and community marketing manager at Eventbrite, and I will be your host today, coming to you live from my home in Oakland, California. Eventbrite's reconvene sessions is our ongoing event series that gives you a peek behind the curtain of some of our favorite events. And these sessions are really meant to empower event creators to share experiences building and hosting events while passing along useful strategies for your events and businesses. Um, let's do a quick tutorial of our streaming platform. So you have your chat thread to the right and everyone should be able to join in on the conversation there. Below the video and my really big head, you'll see an overview of today's event and information about our speakers. So if you wish to connect with them, you can find links to their social media profiles there. Next to that overview tab, you'll see a tab for questions. Um, that is where you can pop in anything you'd like to ask our speakers throughout today's event. And you can even upvote questions from others. Definitely note down if your question is for a specific speaker and we'll do our best to answer as many of the questions as we can. You'll then see a third tab for our survey. And we always appreciate your feedback on reconvene sessions as it's our goal to make these as useful for you as possible. So please just take a minute or two to share your thoughts with us before you head out today. So to get us started, I have a prompt for those of you who are, are already in the chat. And that question is, what is your most effective marketing channel? It could be Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, any of the social medias, email, word of mouth, flyers, street teams, anything that you find to drive the most tickets for your events. And hopefully you'll see someone mention something that you haven't thought of before. And the reason I asked that question is because today's session is all about how to sell out your events. I think we all know those events that seemingly sell out in minutes, like just like that, but really how does that happen? And that's what we'll look to try to answer today. So let's take a look at what we have in store for the next hour. First up, we'll talk with Han Santana Sales, who is the Director of Artist Collaboration at Meow Wolf. And Han will share how Meow Wolf has built such a stellar reputation with both collaborators and visitors that you're almost guaranteed to see long lines at their doors. And then we'll hear from Eric Jones, who is the founder of The Outlet LA. And Eric will dive into the details of his social media and advertising strategy that consistently packs, packs out his events. And then finally, We'll be joined by Whitney Lamora, who is the founder and curator of The Martin in Chicago. And Whitney will share her hospitality-driven approach to building that large, loud, and proud roster of regulars. And I'm so excited to share my conversations with these three incredible event creators. But guess what? During the talks, Han, Eric, and Whitney, they're going to be in the chat with you live. So feel free to ask them questions during the conversations, and they will do their best to jump in and answer you on the fly. They're also going to join us for a live Q&A at the end of today's session, so definitely stick around and ask your questions then as well. And while we have these three speakers, expert speakers, on our virtual stage, I want to remind us that there's also a wealth of knowledge in this room right now. You are all event creators. You have your own experiences, so I encourage you to connect and share ideas throughout today's event. And really quickly before we get started, I just want to make sure that we're set up for success. Um, you know, we are a community of creators and we strive to create community for others through our events. And we really want to model what community looks like. So let's encourage one another. Let's be curious. Let's be grounded in the spirit of learning. The chat today will be monitored and harassment of any kind will not be tolerated. A full recording of today's session will be posted with closed captions after the event on Eventbrite's YouTube channel. And finally, if you're sharing anything uh, from today's experience, you can use our hashtag reconvene so that we can all connect really easily. That's my spiel. I'm ready to get into it. I hope you are as well. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Han Santana Sales. Han is the curator of the uh, is the curator and the director of artist collaboration for Meow Wolf, which is an immersive collaborative arts ex exhibition based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And for those of you who are not familiar with Meow Wolf, they have three permanent art exhibitions in Santa Fe, Denver, and Las Vegas, and they're constantly building their interactive worlds in various places around the country. They sell out consistently, and they're a must-see attraction for both residents and visitors. Okay, back to Han. Han graduated Colorado College, and after several years of community organizing, art making, and curation in Colorado Springs, she joined Meow Wolf as an artist liaison in 2018. And in her role, she aims to curate 
the best creatives across every medium throughout the world while offering exhibitions as a platform for diverse, emerging, and underrepresented artists across the country. Please join me in welcoming Han Santana Sales. Han, welcome to Reconvene Sessions. We're so excited to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, first off, tell us um, a little bit about yourself and how you became the Director of Artist Collaboration at Meow Wolf. Absolutely. Um, so I've been with Meow for about five years, since 2018. Uh, I started out actually as an artist liaison. They were looking for somebody to support the project that they were working on in Colorado at the time. And I had come from working at a small nonprofit in Colorado Springs where I had been developing a lot of really tight community relationships with other artists and creators across the state. And I thought I could really help them out. So I wrote a funny cover letter for them uh, and told them all about my consulting experience and community building experience. And I got the gig to work with them for that project. Uh, once I was there, I realized that what they really needed was for somebody to build out a program for them that could be applicable for all future guest artists, which is what we call our collaborating artists at Bia Wolf. So that role from the Colorado exhibit evolved into what it is today, which is the director of artist collaboration. I love that. So you've really helped Meow Wolf scale their operations, especially from the artist side. And, um, you know, I know Meow Wolf is now this experiential destination, but I'm curious if it was always popular, like, was there any particular moment where uh, you knew once you joined that you were really onto something? Yeah, absolutely. So I joined in 2018 and the company incorporated becoming a business in 2016. And so they started working together though in 2008. Um, so that was when they were still just like a ragtag group of artists who were working inside of warehouses and other um, not legit venues. Uh, and really it was just about creating art. And so one pivotal moment was in 2011 when they made this large exhibit called The Do Return. Uh, they had been given a space by the Center for Contemporary Art and they decided to build a 40 foot ship that you could actually dock um, and get a board that had two different stories. And this was their most ambitious project to date. And the idea was that it was an alien ship that had like crash landed on earth. And so they, for the first time, accepted donations. They had been doing all of this work for free just as an art project. And at the end of the exhibit, at the end of three months, they had collected $30,000 in donations and had about um, 10,000 visitors in that course, which is unheard of for like a gallery show, right? Usually you can get a couple hundred people through a door for a gallery show. Uh, and so after that, they built the House of Eternal Return, which opened in 2016. That's our flagship location in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And they had hoped for attendance of 125,000 guests and after six months, they had hit that milestone. And after the first year, they had 300,000 guests come through our flagship exhibit. So really they knew from that you know, moment of the due return. And then once they took the leap and opened it as a business, it's always been phenomenally successful, which has allowed us to continue to grow. That's incredible growth. And um, where is it at today? I mean, uh, going from you know, initially you said about 10,000 people to then 30,000 people. Like, where is Meow Wolf out at today? Yeah, so right now we have three open exhibits uh, and our attendance for 2022 was 2.7 million visitors in the year. Um, and we're opening a fourth exhibit. We actually just had tickets go on sale this week for our forthcoming exhibit called The Real Unreal. Uh, and that's in Grapevine, Texas, just 15 minutes north of the DFW airport there. So we're on track definitely for um, 3 million visitors in the coming year with this new exhibit that we're opening. Absolutely incredible. And I would love today to dig into a little bit of the aspects of how you've gotten such incredible growth and built that repu reputation really nationally and internationally. And so I'd love to start with kind of your process of mm -hmm. planning and executing a successful exhibit that you feel confident is going to drive a big audience. Like where does it start? What are the steps along the way? Yeah, absolutely. And so my area of expertise, as I've mentioned, is our collaborating artist program. And so the square footage that might take up in an exhibit is anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of an exhibit space. And so I'd love to just share some images of collaborating artists work. We'll have an opportunity to look at them here, flip through. <laughs> 
Um, and these are examples of artist work that we have open and they are guest artists, as I mentioned, to all of our projects. So they do this single commission with us and then they go on, you know, in their independent practice. So my first step with this whole thing is doing research on a given city or a market where we land. It's really important to me that we work regionally um, in that city or in that state. So I do a lot of in-depth research. Um, our marketing team hires external firms to help us and I generate artist lists. I go after like-minded institutions, galleries, DIY spaces, because we're always looking to support like unknown and emerging artists. Um, and once I, I do that all before I even go to the city, once I'm in the city, I look to hire what we call an artist liaison. Um, so this is my boots on the ground person. Uh, they're typically a curator themselves, or sometimes they're an artist or both. And they help me build artist lists and they will also help our artists execute their projects on site. They also stay on board once we open the exhibit and make sure that Meow continues to be a supportive institution in like a given city's ecosystem by helping with public mural projects or new installations. Um, so in addition to the artist liaison, we hire creative consultants. Um, these folks, we typically advise on our exhibition plans really early on. Uh, they could be community members, other creatives. Um, the idea is that they have some kind of deep socio-political tie to that region, and we hire them to give feedback on our storyline overall, so that making sure that it has resonance, right, with that region. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I do is I hire curators, other curators that are local, um, and they can be from institutions or individuals who are just huge artist advocates and supporters, and they help me build up our artist list. So they know where all the best artists are and who's good to work with. Um, so in addition to my own research, we generate lists of hundreds of artists in the region. And then I go through them with our creative directors. And from that, we narrow it down to like a small cohort of artists that we invite to propose for a Meow Wolf project. Um, so we're pretty refined in our process at this point where we've categorized projects by types of complexity. And so depending on what the project is, the artist will receive that type of onboarding so that we can support them with professional development tools on how to scale their work. Because a lot of folks aren't used to working with the materiality that we have and at the scale that we have, right? Because we make like immersive environments and we're working with fine art gallery artists often. Um, so once we approve their proposal, um, we have phases of development, pretty typical to large scale projects, which is a design phase, a fabrication phase and an installation phase. Um, all of that is really hand in hand with our producers on our project team. And then I come back to help promote the artists with our marketing team. Mm -hmm. And so a big emphasis for us is elevating our collaborators. Uh, we work with them to create mini documentaries. We do press releases. We host paneling, panel conversations about their work. And all of this is really in service of sharing their individual stories and also by doing that, sharing the story of the region so that our exhibit is in conversation and in this critical dialogue visually with what the artists are doing in that region. So for me, the success of the exhibit is about the artist experience. Um, another thing that I do is at the end of every collaboration, I survey everybody and I really make plans to act on all of the feedback to improve the experience for the next cohort. And so when you put that much attention and detail into becoming a member of a community um, and making sure that you're a platform for the artists that are in that community, your reputation just increases and a big portion of your audience is really familiar then with these new artists and with the fact that you care about their region, not just so that you can come in and make money off of an exhibit, um, but that we're doing this in, in, to be in dialogue, really to have a more brilliant exhibit by inviting these people to the table. Um, so it makes it more gratifying. And I really know that a lot of people associate us with working with these local artists. And that is like part of our reputation and part of the reason that people come to me. Right. And it, and it truly differentiates you. And, you. and you mentioned your audience a little bit. And that's that next thing that I would like to dig into is like, how do you think about Meow Wolf's audience? And how does how you think about them factor into the art and the exhibitions that you end up creating. Yeah, absolutely. So we have identified some big buckets. So we have Meow Wolf fans. Those are folks that love Meow Wolf. They will follow us. They have Reddit sub threads where they're pulling permit documents. <laughs> um, we have art and culture lovers. Um, you know, this is people who may not know Meow Wolf yet, but 
they are excited about a new trip to kind of re-engage or learn about it for the first time. And then we have people who are tourists in that city. So they look up in the city, what are fun, interesting things to do in Denver and Meowth comes up. Um, so they don't know what they're in for. This could often be like a big family, you know, group or a draw. And then of course there's locals. So people that go to the area multiple times, like they go to events frequently or they host other visitors because they're proud of having it in their city, in that region. Um, and they're interested in programming. They're interested in like events or classes or new installations when we rotate things inside of the exhibit. So I curate um, for that category of like art and culture lovers um, mm -hmm. and of course local, but what I do is relevant to everybody because you can come into the exhibit knowing nothing and you leave knowing our story and the story of many of the collaborating artists that are in the exhibit. Um, so for me, it's really an emphasis on supporting these underrepresented emerging artists. Like my overall mission is to elevate the value of artists in society. And I really love Meowth as a platform because there's no barrier to entry of somebody seeing themselves as, you know, somebody who would go to a gallery or even a museum. Um, so the audience that we see is super diverse and a lot in terms of age, like you see people of all ages um, because it's not presented in a way that, um, yeah, just low barrier for entry. It's very unpretentious. It's really just come have an experience um, and then they end up learning and, you know, experiencing these new artists work, you know, and actually having being open, being more open because of that. So um, for me, yeah, it's all about the the artists, and I think that audiences are pleasantly surprised often by like the depth of the experience once they see it. Right, it, it's such a beautiful challenge when you want something that is suitable for everyone, but that is curated enough for those specific groups that you outlined, where they come away with something that they find valuable. So, oh, and totally, that's totally. So they, we have this like kind of phrase um, when we're trying to describe to artists like how to create enough depth in the work that there is something there for both a nine-year-old and a 90-year-old. <laughs> and if we can hit that sweet spot, then it's very successful. Yeah, uh, I love that as uh, almost like a, yeah, it's a, a framework and a measure of um, uh, not necessarily success, but uh, it's a measure to know that you're reaching the the right people. And uh, yeah. we've talked about reconvene sessions before, like even the grandmother test, like when you're explaining something, if your grandmother can understand it, then you're, you can be confident that a lot of people can understand it as well. Yeah, it just comes back to what is truly accessible and um, who who are you making the work for? So just making it broad enough, assuming an intelligent audience, but also again, assuming that there's something there for a lot of different ages and different life experiences. Yeah, totally. Um, all right, I have one last question for you. Um, and this one maybe is a little bit personal, uh, personal curiosity of mine, but I'm curious, what has been Meow Wolf's most popular project and why do you think it's been the most popular one? Yeah, so in terms of um, traffic, it would have to be Convergent Station. Um, and some of that is just because it's huge. Uh, Convergent Station, for folks who haven't been, is five stories. It's 90,000 square feet of exhibit space, four stories of actual exhibit. One of them is for like our maintenance team. Um, we worked with 130 artists from Colorado across 80 different installations. Uh, and that was only 40% of the exhibit. So the other 60% is all these huge Meow Wolf worlds and our own internal artist installations. And the entry point for the exhibit is an alien transit station that takes you to the space called the Converged Worlds. Um, and the idea is that four unique alien worlds have mysteriously, portions of them have mysteriously um, ripped off of their home planets and they converge together. They congealed into one. And so somebody made this transit station in Denver that takes you to the converged world. So you can explore these four large worlds. Um, and, you know, besides it being like an interesting project with so many amazing local artists, really good tie in, um, we also had a really wonderful marketing campaign leading up to it. It was a partnership with Wyden and Kennedy. And it was essentially like a surreal tourism campaign designed to prepare um, using cryptic billboards um, that were in an alien language with no explanation. Like there was nowhere that said Meow Wolf on it. It was just, you know, like 
alien text and people had to figure it out. <laughs> um, and then they, we did like rogue flyering um, that we're talking about. One of the themes of the exhibit is memory as currency. Um, and you can trade memories as part of this theme in one of the city streets of the exhibit. And so we did a lot of flyering around town with that. We did this amazing um, collaboration with Brett McKenzie from Flight of the Concords, where he created this uh, video for us called Get Out and See the Worlds. Um, and it's super wonderful. We'll add a link to it in the chat for folks to check it out. Um, and then we also did like a pop-up newsstand in Denver's Union Station um, with souvenirs and reading materials from the multiverses, again, that could be purchased with memory. Uh, so I felt like the, the buildup and the campaign around that thing was just super successful and continues to be like an area of curiosity for a lot of people. Yeah, and I love the so there's so many different aspects of marketing. You didn't rely on just one particular tactic. You got very creative um, in in how you you know spread the word, uh, even in the most cryptic ways. I, I love that, and it sparks my curiosity. I would definitely want to go find out what that is if I if I couldn't figure it out from a billboard already. So um, yeah. Yeah, really uh, incredible uh, creativity. Han, thank you so much for sharing so much of um, your insights and the and, uh, inner workings of Meow Wolf. Uh, super excited to get into the live Q&A uh, in a little bit, but thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really fun. I can't wait to have more questions from people. Yeah, me too. See you soon. Oh my God, Han. I cannot thank you enough for such a detailed peek behind the curtain of Meow Wolf. Um, I know that I'm walking away with at least three clear takeaways that I think we all can apply to our work. Um, first is elevate your collaborators. You know, not only does this help um, strengthen your relationships with artists that you work with, but it also helps with your marketing. You focus on local, regional, relevant artists you promote the crap out of the artist, the DJ, the speaker, or any collaborator that you're working with. Share their stories, and by doing that, you will share the story of the region, really resonating with your audience and getting them interested in your event. And second, survey often and action the feedback. You know, asking for input from collaborators shows that you truly care about the experience you provide them and the audience. But simply asking isn't enough. You really need to action that feedback as soon as possible. And, and doing that will strengthen your reputation as a member of a community that cares about the region and not just a company that's trying to make some money. And lastly, uh, Han said she programs for both the nine-year-old and the 90-year-old. And you may have identified a target market for your events, and that's definitely a good thing. And it's also important to remember that you want everyone who comes to your events to have a positive experience. So you may be marketing your event to a specific demographic, but you want to be accessible and program an experience that's suitable for people from a range of backgrounds and experiences. So that's what I took away from my chat with Han, but everyone in the chat, um, tell me if I missed something that stood out to you. And and while you're jumping, uh, dropping uh, those additional takeaways in, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, who is Eric Jones. And Eric is an entrepreneur through and through. Uh, with the help of his mother, he launched a designer dress shoe company before he graduated college. And then after graduating from the University of Arkansas, he got even busier. He started the Outlet LA, which has become the fastest growing black owned event curation company to host upscale gatherings. And he is also uh, the founder of Dr. Dapper Business Growth Academy, which is meant to help other self-starters and creatives find success. So he's here to share his expertise with us today. So please join me in welcoming Eric Jones. Eric, thank you so much for joining us for Reconvene Sessions today. How are you feeling? Living in paradise. Living in paradise. I love it. Um, so first off, would love for you to tell us where you got the name Dr. Dapper from and how you incorporate that persona into the outlet LA. Yeah, so Dr. Dapper came from uh, back when I was a kid, really. Uh, I, I grew up in church. Mom was a first lady, stepped as a pastor. I played the drums in church. And as soon as I popped out, I had a little bow tie on. My mom had me all dressed up and stuff. So that evolved over time. And I went to college, and people liked the way I dressed. So I started styling a little bit. And I connected it, the doctor and the dapper because I was styling people <clears throat> to be more dapper. And I felt like 
when you have a problem with something that you that's going on with your life, your body, or, or whatever it might be, you go to the doctor to get fixed. So I connect the doctor with Dapper because I was fixing people's style and making it more Dapper. So that's what that came about. And it connected, it connected with the outlet because I love curating upscale spaces where people can dress up. And uh, everything that I do aligns with my lifestyle. So that makes it a lot easier for me to, you know, build a business, scale a business, and things like that. It's effortless ease for me. All right. uh, I might have to set up a consulting session with you after uh, this chat, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll stay on topic for now. Um, so, yeah, you've, you've reached this you know, fantastic level of success in your events. They really like naturally create this atmosphere of success. So I'm really curious to hear how you think about success for your events. Are there any particular metrics, pieces of data that you look at? For one, I mean, figuring out who, who are the people that are coming to my events. And it could be like in person, talking to them to figure out more about their life. It could be on Instagram, looking at analytics to see how old they are, where do they live uh, and things like that. And beyond that, it's it's it goes deeper into like the when you go into Facebook and, uh, and and looking at the ads and different things like that on the back end. So it's a lot of back end stuff that I look at and I also send uh, forms out. So I do a lot of surveys. I, ask, I tell a lot of people we don't have to shoot in the dark no more. We got surveys on Instagram and we can do forms on Google. So I learned a lot about my audience from like communicating with them in person, active, active, being active with them uh, through email, as well as through forms and just surveys. So it's pretty dope to find out a lot about them that way. Yeah. Do you ever do anything special to get people to fill out the forms? I know that in, in my past, uh, you know, jobs, I've always had trouble getting people to actually like respond to the forms. Do you do anything special to incentivize them to fill it out and provide you feedback? Well, sometimes I'll be like, enter for a chance to win a free VIP ticket to the next event. And then uh, mm -hmm. I will, you know, that's an incentive for them to do it. So, uh, but other than that, I just send it out and just hope that people engage with it and, uh, you know, want to give the feedback because people enjoy it feeling like they're a part of something and like they had a say so in something. So it's like, I don't want this to just be about me. You know, I want your opinion because we want to make this better for you. So how can I always spin it back to make it like this is for you? So let's hear your feedback. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah it works out pretty good like that. I like that. Um, all right, let's get into marketing, which is what this topic is all about. Really trying to like understand how you sell out your events. So can you share some uh, tactics and tools that you use to market your events? Content is king. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not capturing your, your events, you, you slack it, you know? So uh, I feel like that's the first thing when it comes to really drawing people in. I always say, I want people to experience my events before they actually experience them. So mm -hmm. I have to make sure I have a quality videographer, quality photographer, and then understand aesthetics on social media as well. So. That's, that's probably like one of my top things uh, that I do because even before I got into ads and event by boost and all those other features, the content was something that sparked the word of mouth. And then on Instagram, a lot of people share stuff. People like to be the source of new information. So it's like putting the call to actions out there. If you if you don't tell people what to do with the content you're, you're putting in front of them, they're probably not going to do it. You, so you have to always have your call to actions in the captions and even in the video. So I think that's like at the top of my list of like tactics. And then I got into ads last year and that took my email list like crazy, insane, which we can get into that too. But, you know, I, I marketed it from, I think another tactic is having a, having a landing page, you know, you and having that funnel. So a lot of people don't really structure their events business as like a true business. So you really have to build a house around this idea and this concept that you have for doing events. And that allows you to be able to scale a lot more because then you, you're, you're building a community outside of social media where you are posting this content. The content is used to draw people in and then you have to capture those people and then you have to engage with those people. So like that goes to community engagement. I love community engagement. So those are, long story short, those are like the different little tools and little pieces that I use to really, you know, just scale and grow and engage with the audience. And is the content that you're distributing, do you um, have different types of content that you're distributing on social media and Instagram versus on your landing page versus on email. I know you, you mentioned that I would actually love to dig into email because I think that it's it's so hard to stand out within people's inboxes. So I'm mm -hmm. curious how you do that. But first, like, how do you think about the uh, the content differentiation between those different channels? Yeah, I feel like social media, we spend our time there to be entertained. So this content should be very entertaining. Um, and yeah, sometimes we talk about infotainment, like how can I entertain people while, while informing them at the same time? So I try to make sure I add some form of information in there as well, but for the most part, it's, it's entertaining 
and it's it's showing like this level of beauty and it's exp I even made a definition for the outlet woman and the outlet man, you know, and, and what that literally stands for. And then the imagery that shows those people how I want people to dress because you can say upscale, dapper and elegant, but if you don't show them like what that looks like and they don't see it in videos and in, in photos on your page, they're just like, they shoot in the dark. They don't know what they should put on. So uh, I think that kind of content is what I do on social media, reels, long form content, et cetera. And then when it goes over to email uh, and text marketing, that's more so just imagery. And even let's talk about the emails to, to engage with them in the emails. I use gifts. I'm a very fun, you know, vibrant, full of bliss type of dude. And I'm like, I want people to feel a level of freedom and welcomeness and, and love and joy and happiness. I don't want them, I don't want them to look at the email and see like a whole lot of text and then like some some dull images. It's like, yo, send them a gift, you know, send something funny. And, and I think that that allows me to really stand out and get the engagements that I want. Within yeah, my I love that really show don't tell. And if any of you in the audience are not including pictures from your past events on your event pages, you're really missing out because content is king. You got to show don't tell. And you know what? Stop. Delete the flyer when the event's done. Like that don't do nothing. I hate going to pages and seeing flyers from last year. Like what are we doing? <laughs> well, well, we lost in the sauce. Like, <laughs> like you showing me flyers, but it's like, show me the recap, show me the photos, you know, and, that, and that's where I feel like a lot of brands, they fail because they don't keep that page super aesthetic and super appealing. It's, it's just like walking into a house. If I walk into a cluttered house, I don't want to be there. So your page should be similar to your house. Keep it clean, keep it in order. And when people come there, they should know what they're coming there for, what they're going to get, where they can get it, and the call to action to tell them, you know, all right, yeah, go get this. So, yeah, you got to keep it, keep it clean. You know, clean, clean that page up. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Clean and concise. Um, mm -hmm. All right, you mentioned Eventbrite Boost. Want to dig into that tool a little bit. I know that you've been using it for a little while now. Um, what do you like most about the Eventbrite Boost tool? I think it... So meta can be complicated, you know, using the, the, the ads manager. So I think, not think, I know Eventbrite Boost made it a lot easier for someone like me to come in that's not an expert in the ad space and be able to plug and play. So that's why I like it a lot. I, lo I love it because it's super user friendly. It's, it's easy to figure out. It's, it's just, it, to me, it's comparable to a Squarespace, you know, because when you, when you compare a Squarespace to Shopify, Squarespace is a lot more user friendly and drag and drop. Shopify is a lot more like intricate, in my opinion, you know, like coding a website. So I think this Eventbrite Boost platform is similar to making, to taking coding and making it a lot like easier or taking ads and making it a lot easier for somebody like me to, to just win that has an, a dope product and wants to get it in front of more people. So that's why I like it. I love it. Yeah. Um, and are there any like particular aspects of Boost that you think other event creators should be taking advantage of definitely uh look-alike audience like if you when you go inside the ad space you get to choose you know who you're targeting so really knowing you know who that what that avatar is so i think even before you get into event right boost know who you're targeting no actually get some data behind it to see like okay who who's why is it more men or is it more women you know are they at 35 to 45 are they 25 to 30 or do they live in la do they live in dc you know where do they live and then that's kind of like laying a foundation so you can build on to say, okay, well, what do these women that are 35 to 45, they live in Los Angeles, do? Do they, do they listen to music on Spotify? Do they listen to R&B? Do they like Afro beats? Do they like this? Do they like that? Do they shop here? You know, and, and that really allows you to build that avatar so you're not wasting marketing dollars just shooting, just shooting stuff out. It's like, dog, no, you waste the money. Like, right. really back in and then take your time to figure that out. So, I, I, and then once you figure that out, so much technology, you go into Eventbrite Boost and you do lookalike audiences, people that have engaged in previous posts. And now you're not losing that data, but you're, you, you're gaining so much because you've hyper-focused on this avatar that you've discovered is coming to your events on the regular. And now you get to go find, let, let Eventbrite Boost and Meta go do the work to find more of those people and bring them back to you. So, uh, and even I've used the same recap videos for a year because even though 100,000 people might've saw that, a million people live in LA that need to see it. Right. So it's like you can continue to, to recycle that content. If it's really good content, you don't have to force stress yourself uh, uh, over just thinking I need to make a new recap video every event 
you know, and then market each event separately. You know, I market my stuff like here's a recap video that shows the vibe of the outlet. If you like this vibe, here's a landing page where you can sign up for email list. And then they, they get an automated email that says here are the upcoming events. And then they have this long, this, uh, what's the word? I can't even think of the word. Your workflow. They say on uh, Flowdesk, I use Flowdesk, your workflow of like emails that come in uh, within that funnel. So it's, it's all automation, Put, it, it, plugging in systems to make, you know, event curation like a real business and brand and things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That allows you to, you know, rinse and repeat things really quickly. It allows you to scale the business so that you're not spending so much. Once you've found a formula that works, you're not spending so much time building that formula again. You yeah. find those different marketing automations. Are there any other tools? You mentioned Flowdesk. Any other things like, especially what you, um, I, I love that, the detail that you gave about the audience. Like, what do they listen to on Spotify? Where do they go and shop? Like, where do you get that audience insight from? Is that from your surveys or is that from other research that you do? I do, I do a lot. I do surveys a lot on Instagram, on the stories, um, mm -hmm. I post on the, on the feed a lot. And then um, also just talking to people in person. But outside of that, the data is just, it's just roaming. I, I know that people love R&B. So Spotify was a specific thing, but I know my audience loves R&B. I know they love live music, you know, and because I've built an audience of people that love what I love. So uh, that that's, you asked the question before, you asked the question before that though, that led to that. Any other, uh, any other tools that you use to like automate your processes? Oh, uh, I use community. I use an assistant, hire an assistant. <laughs> so that automates a lot of stuff. I'm like, hey, go ahead and knock that out for me. Um, so yeah, community is, is good. They get expensive. Uh, Flowdesk, like I said, is great. Um, and, and then the assistant. Outside of that, everything else is. Kind of, I, I just enjoy doing. Like I don't have a, a a posting calendar, something that automatically posts to my Instagram because I, I I might wake up feeling a different way than I felt yesterday, mm -hmm. or I might wake up and I might have an idea or a concept. Or I might see a meme. Or I might see a viral video that I, that I can take and I can package it, present it, and promote it. And, and connect it to my brand. So I think that's important as well to be able to, if you're creative, allow yourself space to be creative. Um, and I think the automation of posts is, is there's, there's pros and cons. Like I said, I wake up one day and I'm like, I actually don't want that to go out today. I want this to go out today. Mm -hmm. So I like to, I like to have mine open format, just free and uh, just post however I'm feeling that day. But I just love content. So that's just me. Right. I mean, and it's hard to replicate and automate the genius that is Dr. Dapper. Yeah, you can't. You can't. I'm him. I'm one of one. <laughs> you won't find him anywhere else. <laughs> Love that energy. And uh, Eric, thank you so much for chatting with us today. We have a little bit more time with you later for live Q&A. So everybody stay tuned for that. More from Dr. Dapper. But Eric, thank you so much. And we'll chat more. Love. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Eric. I wish um, we had even more time to pick your brain. We do uh, at the end of the session in the Q&A, but I think in just 13 minutes, you shared uh, a ton of valuable takeaways. And the first thing that stuck with me is delete your promo flyers after your event and replace it with a recap. It seems like such an obvious thing, but the fact that Eric says he sees it all the time means that people forget. So keep your pages updated, add pictures and videos from past events so your visitors immediately feel the vibe of what you want to create. And keep it clean, keep it in order. When people go there, they should know what they're looking for, what they're going to get, where they can get it, and see a really clear call to action to tell them to go get it. And then another piece of advice from Eric is to use lookalike audiences. This is really one of the best ways to expand your reach while keeping your marketing dollars really targeted to where they'll have the most impact. And it starts with understanding your audience. So make sure you give that some thought as well. And lastly, think about social media as infotainment. Um, we're all on social media to be entertained. So when designing content for Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok, Really make sure that it's fun and engaging first, and then find ways to add bits of information that you want to relay to your viewers. So big shout out again to Dr. Dapper and drop comments in the chat with other key takeaways that you heard from him. And now it's time for our final speaker, Whitney Lamora. 
Whitney is a Chicago-based creative whose artistic background spans from theatrical production to art curation, entrepreneurial leadership, goal-oriented mentorship, and more. Um, she is the founder and curator of The Martin, which is an artist's first full-service gallery and creative space. And she is also the creative director of Dorothy, which is a neighborhood lesbian cocktail lounge. She has been leading events in Chicago since 2016 and is helping shape some of the most innovative, radical queer spaces and events in the city. So she's here to share some of her hospitality driven tactics for fostering returning customers. So please join me in welcoming Whitney Lamora. Whitney, welcome to Reconvene Sessions. We're so excited to have you here with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You know, you, as we saw in the little bio that I just gave, you are a person of so many different talents. You wear so many different hats, although you're not wearing one right now. Tell us about the three spaces that you run in Chicago. Absolutely. I will start with the Martin. The Martin is a artist first gallery and creative space. I opened in 2018 just looking for a space that I can continue to throw my own events and really get creative. And it has now shifted into a gallery first and event spec second sort of space. So it's really, really beautiful. And I'm, I'm so glad to be running it now five years in. We are attached to Split Rail, which is a neighborhood restaurant in the West Town neighborhood of Chicago. I serve as the creative director for Split Rail, so I curate artwork for the space and I run and manage events like private dinners and celebrations, stuff like that. And then thirdly, in our basement, we have a cocktail lounge called Dorothy. She is one of 27 lesbian cocktail lounges in this nation. I also serve as creative director down there. so. I produce all of our events and really kind of focus our creative and, and fun happenings in the lounge. I love it. And they're also connected. I would imagine that a lot of the programming um, kind of feeds into one another, which is, is really cool. Um, today's conversation is all about developing um, repeat regulars, people that are constantly mm. coming back to your spaces. And I'm hoping that you can share with us some strategies of converting people who are coming to your space for the very first time into repeat regulars, really establishing that long-term relationship. Absolutely. All of it comes down to hospitality. So I was lucky enough to be introduced and start working in at Split Rail in 2018, the same year that I was attempting to find a space and open what would become the Martin. And it was the first restaurant that I had worked in that was so hospitality forward and hospitality driven. Mm -hmm. A restaurant space, much like an event space, much like any other space for the public can often feel just very sales driven or very impersonal and just simply like we're here to give you some food and some drink. And um, under the leadership of Chef Zoe Shore and her previous business partner, Michelle Zott, I really learned a, a completely different way of approaching guests. Mm -hmm. And that goal was to create a welcoming neighborhood restaurant full of regulars and full of people who are as invested in the space as we were in the business. Mm. So I learned a lot of really valuable tools. In the restaurant space, we have some advantage, some advantages that we don't have in the other spaces. One of them is our reservation system where we can keep notes on who the guests are. If they're VIP, aka family members, best friends, um, investors, things like that. Um, we can also keep notes that like this person is crazy about gin. Um, this person loves uh, this appetizer. This person mm -hmm. loves this one thing that that used to be on the menu, but isn't anymore. And can we put it together for them? So any details like that, that can really draw people back in to be recognized, to be seen. And I really think that is the through line of all three spaces. So once I was able to open my own space, I really focused on using those same principles with anyone who would walk in the door with me. Um, not only not only acting like, you know, I've seen them before with very specific language, like it's great to see you uh, instead of nice to meet you, um, mm -hmm. which can sometimes make people uncomfortable if they've already met you before. You know, when you're in these spaces, you're creating events, you're working in a restaurant, you're working in a cocktail lounge. Sometimes you literally come across and interact with hundreds of people in a week, and it's really hard to keep all of that in your own brain. And mm -hmm. so using a lot of hacks, 
like specific language and general language as well. Um, intentionality really is is where it all comes down to. So mm -hmm. greeting people, welcoming, welcoming them in, um, really making them feel seen. If you even have an inkling that you've seen this person before, saying it's so nice to see you again, um, mm -hmm. things like that. And, and really implementing them in all three spaces. Um, in our cocktail lounge, we don't have the same reservation system that we have upstairs, but our team and, and myself as really the sole creative director um, of our events program really takes the time and care to notice, remember, and really make a special experience for everyone who comes in, specifically when it comes to things that we can provide to them such as we remember that this person is sober, you know, so if they come into our cocktail lounge and we can make them the best new version of a cocktail that is spirit free, that's going to take them above and beyond and want to return, bring their friends um, and really feel safe and welcome. When you're wearing your event creator hat, like you said, you don't have that same reservation system. Are there any specific tools or processes that you have for yourself, for staff to remember those little details because like you said you're meeting potentially hundreds of people a week it's really hard to remember like do you have any specific tools or using an excel spreadsheet like how do you keep track of all of that info i think a lot of it is is intuition which is really hard to say right and i know the folks who are attending this session today are like great be more intuitive um, which is really hard and almost impossible to to train um be a little intuitive you know something that i like to do especially if i'm checking in a large event is pull up the Eventbrite check-in list before I even open the doors and kind of cruise through and say, oh, I recognize these names. I've seen these names before. Mm. Oh, I know this person. I'm not going to be able to see them. Uh, you know, I'm really hoping that I recognize them when they come in, talking to the staff, talking to my gallery assistant, um, to my partner, to, to anyone throughout who's like, oh, who is this person? Um, also comparing it to the reservations list upstairs. If, mm. if you see so that someone's having a dinner upstairs and having them either walk into the gallery, we have a door that connects the restaurant to the gallery um, and saying, how was dinner? How was your experience? Oh my gosh, I saw you in the restaurant. Now you're here. Thank mm. you so much for coming in. When folks come downstairs, either I saw them in the restaurant or they come with a to-go bag, you know, thanks so much for having dinner with us. How's your dinner experience? Um, another little trick that I have is when I'm checking people in, and this is, of course is for ticketed events, which not all of our events are, but uh, for ticketed events, um, it naturally comes up. I know you can arrange it and search in many different ways, but it naturally comes up by last name, which mm -hmm. I think is a great hack because I'm not expected to remember everyone's last names. And so mm -hmm. I always go with, remind me of your last name, especially if I have a little inkling that I've seen them before, or I know they've been in the space. And even for the most regular of people who I know I've met many times and just cannot remember their names, nobody really truly expects you to remember their full name. And if they do, like, come on now. Um, so that's that's always what I do. And then it's like, yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, I thought so. Come on in. It's so great to see you. Um, you know, we've got we've got a cocktail on special tonight. Check it out. Um, yeah. Make yourself at home. I love that. And I, I think um, for the other event creators in the room, you can look at past attendees. Like if you're, mm -hmm. if you don't have, if you're not one of those spaces that has thousands of people coming to your events and you have maybe 50 or potentially a hundred, that's a small enough number where you can go through and send, you know, create a pivot table and see who's attended a bunch of events. Like maybe I should spend a little bit more time with this person and they become a VIP. They become someone who's then going out into the world and advocating for your space as well. So uh, I really love those, those tips and tricks. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would love to dive into are the, the channels and the platforms that you use to get folks into your spaces. So like marketing hat, time. Um, are there any specific marketing channels, specific types of platforms that you're using to inform people about your space and get them in? Absolutely. There's so many options out here, right? And we're a very small team. And so sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough or I'm not, you know, doing the right thing, but I will share what works for me and the tools that I have found in my limited amount of time uh, that work. To nobody's surprise, Eventbrite. Um, I have, I've been hosting events on Eventbrite for the better part of a decade. And what I've always loved about Eventbrite is, is just so many things. One, it's so easy to use. Two, Eventbrite hustles for you. I just love seeing at the end of every event, how many people came to the event because they found it through an Eventbrite channel. 
Mm -hmm. um, not only do I see that just on the dashboard itself, but what I hear from people who are just like, I just did the what's going on in Chicago search. Um, so I love that. I love using Eventbrite. Um, I love having people follow us on Eventbrite. Um, so every single time I upload an event, it emails them and says, hey, don't miss this event by this new event by the Martin or by Dorothy. So that's that's really, really crucial. Um, email marketing, I think we all know is is the deal. It is it is where you make those actual conversions in this day and age of social media where we are all convinced that that is where it's coming from. It's actually email marketing. And my favorite platform that I have found is Flowdesk. Um, it's F-L-O-D-E-S-K. I really love it. It's beautiful templates, pretty easy to um, to customize and to to drop those email marketing uh, newsletters. I usually do one a week for each of the businesses. That's that's the amount of time that I have. If I'm really needing to push some tickets, I might drop a, a specific uh, event email, an additional one for the week. But a thing that I love about Flowdesk, and I know a lot of other email marketing channels do this, but you can customize it so it drops in that person's name. Um, so it really feels personal, personalized. So if I were to send an email to myself, it would say, hi, Whitney, here's what's going on this week at the Martin. Um, sometimes people think that it is so personalized that they reply back to me in a way as if I've written them that personal email. So I'm sending an email to thousands of people and they'll be like, I'm really sorry, I can't make it this weekend. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's really, it really gets them, you know, actually actually calling them out. And, and again, going back to like really feeling seen. Right. Um, I use Instagram. Instagram is my main social platform. Um, it's the one that I enjoy the best. It's the one that I personally use most often, and it is what I focus on the most for our businesses. So I really utilize the stories features for both Dorothy and the Martin, um, and not as much for the restaurant, but um, I always create a, an events highlight. Um, of course, dropping in the feed and just trying to be strategic around all of that. Those are the three main platforms that I use to market my events. And then if I really need to push a couple of things here and there, I'll get a little more specific. Uh, there's a community based app called Lex, which is very large in the queer community. And so any queer events that we're throwing, especially in Dorothy, I usually drop on there. If tickets are a little slow, we really want to have a lot of people to come out to a free event. Yeah, um, it makes a ton of sense. And I, I want to now dive a little bit deeper into like the strategy that you use potentially across all of those platforms, but really differentiating between your communications with guests before the event, during the event and after the event. So like, how do you think when you think about really trying to build relationships, are there any differences in the communication styles or the information that you're delivering before the event, during the event and after the event? Yeah, absolutely. I think all of it is empowering people with information. And I think that's true through all three of those, but in different ways. So, you know, that all starts by really clearly explaining within the Eventbrite launch and the, the home base for the event itself, what is going to be happening. And that sounds really basic, right? It sounds as basic as the importance of simply saying hello when someone walks in the door. But if you don't know what you're doing at this event, you may not show up, you may show up confused, you may not really get the full experience. And so I think it starts before the event of really explaining, here's, here's what you can expect. If you put a price tag on this event, this is where your money is going. Mm -hmm. I think in our community, especially, it's really important for our community to know that if our ticket sales are going back to the artists, if they are supporting our lounge, if we're donating any of the proceeds, that really makes people make that decision between can I can I purchase this? Can I afford this? Is it worth it? Where's this money going? So eliminating all of those questions and just saying, oh yeah, they're paying all their artists, they're putting some money back into making sure this business still runs and my money is going back to this nonprofit, incredible. You can expect to come and enjoy cocktails. There will be a photographer. Um, there will be a DJ from at eight o'clock to, to 10 p.m., you know, something like that. Um, so I think really, really getting everybody really set and, and ready to come in. For Dorothy especially, it is a 21 up environment. So sending out that, uh, that pre-event email just as a reminder and saying, make sure to bring your physical ID. If you need elevator access, here's how you get it. Just really setting them up for success. Then once they're at the event, always having someone there as a, a greeter. So especially in the gallery space, I think a lot of us, if you, if you go to galleries and you go into art spaces, 
it can be low key a really uncommon thing for someone to simply greet you when you walk in the space. Mm -hmm. And a gallery environment can be really, you know, tough, tough to go into and intimidating. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure around, do I understand the space? Do I know what to do in this space? Mm -hmm. And so it has always been my ethos to have a clear greeting, really guide them. And I have a very, I have a pretty small space, a pretty small, but two room gallery encourage people they can go into both rooms here's where the bathroom is if you want to go into split rail you're more than welcome to do that mm -hmm. and really just encourage them um, and make sure they feel comfortable while they're there mm -hmm. and then afterwards you know if they're a part of our email list you know really continuing to tell them how they can come back and enjoy more um, and then just again as they as they return engaging with them remembering them seeing them and recognizing all of that and of course being thankful and and really creating those relationships in a genuine way while they're there yeah i um i appreciate that outline it's like before the event you're very informative at the event you're very welcoming and then post event you're you're reflective and then trying to remind them of the experience that they had to keep them coming back for a similar type of experience um totally. fortunately whitney that's all the time we have today i feel like we can continue to go on we're just scratching the surface but we do yeah. have the live q a coming up so everyone definitely stick around you can ask whitney more questions whitney thank you so much for sharing your insights with our reconvene sessions crew today thank you so much Thank you again, Whitney. You have such a range of event experiences, and I'm so thankful that you shared that experience with us. Um, Y'all guessed it. I noted down three key takeaways from my chat with Whitney. First is remember details about your guests. Really like act like you've seen them before. Make them feel seen and welcome. It'll add so much to their experience. They're going to feel so special, and that will make them want to return and bring their friends. Um, and to help you with that, review the attendee list before your doors open to see if you recognize anyone who may have attended before. Um, especially when you have smaller audiences or you're just getting started, this really high and intentional attention to detail makes such a difference. And lastly, use marketing to inform the event, uh, event experience to welcome and post event to reflect. You know, your content and your communications should be tailored to what the audience is looking for at different points in the event life cycle. So Whitney, thank you again so much. And now it's time to bring all three of our incredible guests onto our virtual stage, uh, stage so we can ask them some of your questions. So let's welcome them and keep dropping your questions in the questions tab below. And while everyone's getting situated, hello everyone. I'm gonna do a quick plug for our post event survey. Again, really appreciate your feedback on today's session so that we can make these better for you. So take a quick look at that survey tab below me. Spend just a couple minutes answering that before you head out. And we're going to take a little bit of Dr. Dapper's advice already. And we're giving <laughs> away $50 gift cards uh, for those who fill out the survey. So make sure you do that before you head out. Hello, Eric, Whitney, Han. Thank you for being with us today and for those incredible conversations. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, a ton of questions that came through and um, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. We're gonna try to hit as many as we can. Um, but the first comes from uh, Anisha Bray. And um, Anisha says, I'm having trouble transitioning, mentioning the event to getting permission to email them or having them on my list. So this is really a question around how do you like generate more people to be on your email list? I know Eric, you mentioned that like using ads really like your email list started exploding. So Anisha is looking for any advice to grow her email list. And Eric, I would love to start with you. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my email list from went from, to, I guess to give perspective, my email list went from like 3K to 30,000, a little over 30,000 in like six months. Uh, and that's from the same strategy I use with like not marketing a specific event, but marketing the brand itself through like those recap videos. Uh, and then the way that I captured emails from there is just people tap in, type in the email, the name, the number, I always capture numbers too uh, in the form uh, on that landing page. And all of my ads run to my landing page. They don't run to an event. And on that landing page, it explains the outlet. It welcomes, welcomes them to the outlet. Um, and then they get to put their information in, they tap in, and then they get the automation uh, emails to start flowing. And that's the best way I've been able to capture emails. And then on top of that, there was a question in the chat about should they do free events? And I think if you have free events, still put them up there because you're still capturing emails. A lot of people don't know that you can download the CSV file from Eventbrite and then upload it to 
their platform like Flowdesk. And we keep talking about Flowdesk because it's like the most it's, it's it makes the most sense because it's not that expensive and it's user friendly. So, you know, those are my ways of capturing emails. And even if the emails come from Eventbrite people that saw it on Eventbrite or saw it on the ads, they're still being funneled in through Eventbrite uh, or off offline on my own platform, which is my own landing page on Flowdesk. And also in my in the, uh, the link tree in my Instagram bio, uh, the Facebook on the website through the text community. So you all you should have a landing page. So you can have that link that you can send out to people where they can subscribe. And, uh, and then you always tap and we'll do that. So appreciate that. Um, Whitney Han, any other advice for capturing emails, like where you do it, any tactics that you have for it? Yeah, I one of my favorite little just little tricks is, um, as I mentioned in my uh, in my part um, is I keep a events highlight. This especially works best with Dorothy, where we do the majority of our events. And the first uh, highlight that I always keep active on there is join our mailing list. Do you want to know anything about events? Here's a direct link uh, to the mailing list. So anybody who's like, oh, what's coming up next? always the first thing they see uh, is a link to the mailing list. Once they go there uh, with Flowdesk, it's really nice. Uh, you can actually choose to opt in to my other two businesses mailing list um, so they can sign up for all three in one quick stop. Um, and then whenever I send out email newsletters, um, one, I don't, I try to make them beautiful. Uh, I try to not inundate people with emails over and over again. So they hit that unsubscribe. I want to keep them there. Uh, but I always also give them an option to opt in uh, to the other businesses emails list as well so um but yeah plus one to what dr dapper said all of those put your give that give that link and that ability to do uh to have people opt in everywhere you possibly can and you know wherever you can grab them definitely do it <laughs> yeah oh, um i'll talk a little bit about how i capture collaborators um so if you're somebody who is looking for people that you might want to work with, we have a form online where any interested artist can submit their portfolio. Um, sorry, it looks like my service is in. OK, um, it's called Want to Collaborate. And there's a tab on our website that just says artists. And you can scroll down and submit your work. And we use Airtable. That's our back end visual database. It's a great tool for folks looking to store visual information in like an Excel sheet format. Um, and I will sort through that list when we're going to a new city and I'm looking for artists to potentially work with. So it's an open door for us to have people um, who want to be considered for future projects. And I've hired people from that list who I didn't know and they just submitted their portfolio to us. I love that. Yeah, really make sure that it's it's very easy to find where you can sign up both for attendees and collaborators. So um, appreciate those answers. I think we answered two of the question. One was from John as well about how you capture emails either from Eventbrite or Flowdesk, which I think we covered. Um, Going to move on to our next question because we have a bunch of them. This one's from Ali Frank. Um, how do you generate sustainable income from events other than ticket sales? And like, what is your main source of revenue? And Whitney, I would love to start with you if that's cool. So again, the question is, how do you generate sustainable income from events other than ticket sales? And what is your main source of revenue? Alcohol. <laughs> I mean, you know, we run a bar, so it's alcohol. Um, this is not always available for everyone. In my original space, when I first opened the Martin, we had, um, we were not, we can't in the city of Chicago, if you're not, uh, like if you're not a bar, you can't just get a liquor license. So we had a special license that was donations only. And so we'd work, you know, we'd either what early days we would like buy cases of PBR and donate and like hope to make our money back and, you know, do it, do it that way. Um, and then otherwise, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm in, I'm in the restaurant business, gallery business and cocktail lounge business. So it's food, art and, uh, and, and beverage. Um, for anyone who doesn't have that, I would definitely work your angles with partnerships, see what sort of things you can get donated uh, to you that you could potentially resell or, or use for donations. Um, but right now, that's how we essentially, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky that I have a salary job because of these businesses. And so, um, but that's, that's important to us and also gives me an additional platform and additional like option to negotiate getting money, you know, a certain percentage back to the artists and the event throwers, if it isn't uh, just, just straight driven by us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Eric, how about you? 
I got some, I got some good tips on that one. Um, <clears throat> one would be building, actually building a true solid brand and not just throwing events. And then two would be um, looking at your talents within throwing events. Are you a good event planner? Are you good with logistics? Are you good with marketing? You know, you can outsource those um, uh, talents and those skills and you can become independent contractor with other brands. So you're not really stressed about having your people coming in and you selling tickets, but you can be a consultant, we'll say, on the side. Uh, and then the brand part is when you think about Supreme, for example, Supreme, you know, there's a culture around it. There's a level, you feel a certain way, there's a lifestyle around it. So if you can build a brand that hosts a specific type of event for a specific type of person, then you can start to branch off into things like, for example, my attendees might like cigars. I could come out with an outlet cigar line and, and then I could sell those cigars at my events or I could have them on an online website. So it's like thinking outside of the box and thinking, you know, thinking scale on what can this company turn into? Like me, I want to scale the outlet. I'm going to scale the outlet into a global nightlife hospitality group. So I have event spaces, lounges, uh, hotels, um, concierge, villas, private jets, all that kind of, all those kind of things. So it's like those things don't have anything to do with ticket sales, but the ticket sales and curating that experience and building that brand lead to, okay, I know what I can expect from an outlet hotel, or I know what I can ex expect when I get an outlet cigar because the quality of experience that they've curated uh, from day one. So, you know, that's, those are two things I think will be vibes. Yeah, I, I would piggyback off of that. Um, a big revenue driver for us is merchandise. And that, as to what Eric was saying, creating a really strong brand, um, people will want to wear your logo. People will want to be known, you know, as somebody who's associated or somebody who's like in the know with what you're doing. Um, and that's really strong fan base when you have that. And we create merchandise that isn't your typical like off the shelf meow printed t-shirt. In Meow fashion, we make pieces that are art. So we have a whole exhibit called Omega Mart, which is a kind of psychedelic grocery store experience. And you can buy all the products on the shelves and the products are like whale song deodorant or box of spider cereal. Um, <laughs> you know, we have just strange, interesting art you know, objects uh, that are in a very reasonable price range. They're like, you know, $10 for somebody who's not an art collector, but wants something cool on their shelf. Um, but that's a huge source of revenue for us as well. Yeah, merch is really huge. Um, again, I'm going to go back to the questions really quick. This one's like a little bit related, but uh, it is more related to the actual ticket sales. And Noreen asks, what did you charge when you first got started. And um, Eric, I'm going to go back to you really quick for the outlet LA. What did you charge for your events when you first got started? And maybe like, how has that changed? I would imagine as you build a bigger brand, you feel like you can charge a little bit more as you're offering more of an experience. But um, Doreen specifically asked, like, when you first got started, what were you charging for tickets? Yeah, when I started, it was, uh, there were free networking events. So and then and then now every you can not come to an event that's under $30, really. So everything is between like 30 to a hundred dollars. So I think um, the beginning is testing the market, building your community, offering some kind of value, setting the precedence of like, okay, this is going to be a quality experience. It's going to be upscale, getting your content and then figuring out ways that you can do low cost events and, and negotiate good food and beverage minimums or whatever it might be. So you're not charging people a lot, but you're catching someone on the back end from the bar guaranteed, whatever it might be. Or even if you don't have to pay anything out for the space, you're just activating the space. And then that allows you to build uh, credibility, recognition, uh, and just brand presence. And now, like after a year of doing that, yeah, ain't, ain't nothing free. You got to pay for it all. You got to you got to drop some coin because this the, we 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 doing real experiences. So mm -hmm. I think yes, you don't have to start free, <clears throat> but I always say start with start how you want to finish. You know, or even higher than that. You know, it, it's start charge tax plus shipping and handling. You 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 if you're offering a real experience, you know, charge for it. And don't be afraid to um, say, hey, this event is $30 or this event is $40 because there's a, a community of people that's going to pay for it. But just make sure that you can follow up with that quality experience and figure out why would a person want to pay $40 to come to your event? Is it the, is it the entertainment? Is it the other elements? Is it, is it the venue that you're bringing them to that they wouldn't have access to if you weren't doing an event there? So the more exclusivity and, that you can offer and, and if there's a, high, a super niche demographic that you're catering to, you can definitely charge a premium. And uh, I would say, don't be afraid to charge a premium because you can definitely catch a bag from ticket sales before you even get into sponsors and all the other stuff. Yeah, I, I think it's like, 
it's a balance between keeping the barrier of entry low when you're first getting started, but also having that perceived value for your events by charging something for it. So um, Whitney, would love to go to you. Curious, what did you start uh, uh, charging when you first uh, started? Yeah, very similarly, my overhead was so low. Um, I found a storefront here in Chicago in 2018 when I originally opened the Martin and um, we we started off really, really deep, super, super DIY. So we had a ton of free event, events. We had a ton of suggested donation at the door. And then most of our events were sub $20. So that really helped build the community, build the base, really make it a super accessible place for folks to come and throw their own events. Um, and then slowly as we started building uh, more like intimate theater productions and uh, private dinners and things like that, we started raising the ticket prices and started showing people once they were very familiar with the space, um, with with the Martin as a, a destination, we started to build that ticket price. And and now our ranges are, are really kind of all over the place between Dorothy and Split Rail especially. Um, and the Martin is typically just a free accessible space um, and then rentable for private events. So. Um, so now we have events that run anywhere between we do we do some sliding scale um, shows, especially um, especially during Pride, um, because we want to make it accessible for everyone. And then we go up to 100 plus for food and beverage um, specific events. Love that. Then, Han, uh, how about Meow Wolf? What, how does uh, Meow Wolf think about pricing? Yeah, like I mentioned when we were chatting, we also started off as free um, and just donation based until there was a big enough name and people loved it so much that they donated a lot of money. So that was the, the seed money for the large exhibit that we have in Santa Fe. Um, right now, the ticket range is really in like the 30 to $50 range. I just checked our tickets for our new exhibit that opens in July and it's $50. Um, and that's kind of every day of the week. So. I, I agree, yeah, what Whitney and Eric said as well around building a reputation um, before you can increase so that people want to go. Yeah, okay, love that. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question and I'm debating which one it's going to be, but I um, really like the question about um, different types of marketing. And this comes from uh, Melise Bradley. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, it's for Han, but I think that this relates to everybody. Eric Whitney would love your perspective on this as well. Um, what percentage of genuine marketing traditional, so I'm assuming things like email marketing, social media marketing versus like viral marketing does Meow Wolf typically engage in? Like mm -hmm. is true word of mouth the best in your experience? And how do you like think about that balance of how much effort do you put in that traditional marketing versus like maybe experiential, more viral type of marketing? Mm -hmm. um, we do it all for sure. Our version of traditional marketing isn't traditional in that, again, because we're a group of artists, we can't help but make even the marketing and experience an art experience or a piece um, outside of like the alien billboards I mentioned. Um, when we didn't work with large marketing firms, this is just our internal team, we made a billboard in Santa Fe that looked like a fake lawyer and it just said, call the center for existential certainty. Um, and it was a number and you could go to this website that we made about the center for existential certainty. And we just let people figure out that it was us. Um, <laughs> there was like a news anchor story about it because everybody was like, what is this? What's the center for existential certainty? <laughs> um, and it was a fun way to draw our attention to us, you know, kind of like unique creative way to do marketing. I don't see us producing a ton of viral videos. I see more people that we invite to do reviews actually doing viral videos around us. Mm -hmm. So engaging with other people who have big platforms, um, but true word of mouth, it just works exceptionally well for us. Um, and because we're such a unique experience and we're so hard to categorize, it's one of those things where people tell their friends, like, I can't even describe what this thing is to you. It's a little bit like a Disneyland made by artists. It's a little bit like, you know, a museum space or a gallery space, but everything is combined together. And for us, having that super unique footprint is like a must see, people say. Like when you go to New Mexico, you must see Meow Wolf. And having that word of mouth reputation is, yeah, really, really strong for us. Yeah, no, I, I bet. And um, 
appreciate that insight. I, I love that the creativity that, that y'all bring to the marketing, really just sparking everybody's curiosity um, and driving that virality. Um, Whitney, I'm going to toss it to you. Um, how do you think about the balance of traditional marketing versus that more viral type of marketing? Sure. Um, I think I'll, I'll just use Dorothy as the example because that's where we have the highest volume of events and, and definitely the most success of uh, through our event program right now. So what is unique about Dorothy, not only is it a beautiful cocktail lounge in Chicago, but there are many beautiful cocktail lounges in Chicago, um, but it is a lesbian cocktail lounge. So there are only 27 lesbian bars currently in the United States. Um, it is kind of growing every time we get we gain one it feels like we lose one um and in chicago we're lucky enough to have three lesbian bars here but they're all over different parts of town so in the very hyper specific queer community we are a beacon and so we really do rely on word of mouth and just being a home base for the queer community and of course anyone is welcome in the lounge as long as they're not like jerks and haters but um to be honest, uh, I'm I'm a team of one currently, and so I have no time to like. I don't I don't do TikTok. I don't I can't I can't do the viral because I simply don't have time for it. So um, I really do lean on the traditional. Between you know, I really appreciate Eventbrite and how it hustles for us um, using my tried and true Flowdesk weekly emails, um, and then I really focus on Instagram and the biggest difference. And just like Dr. Dapper said earlier, you know, I really, we really started investing in content. And so pretty much everything that we do has a photographer behind it. And so I just have just an endless amount of photos to, to continually churn out to not only show off how beautiful our lounge is, but also the community that's in it. Queer people get so excited to see other queer people being actively queer in spaces. And so that's, that's what I rely on the most. And so I think if you're able to distill your community down and like everybody says they want to, they want to be a space for everyone and they want to throw events for everyone. But at the end of the day, that's just not true. So try to distill your events down to like who you really, really want there, whether it's age range, type of person, personality, whatever, um, that's really going to find the best success for you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Content is King. And we'll go over to the King right here to close us out strong. Eric, Let's go. Um, what do you, uh, how do you think about that traditional marketing versus viral, viral marketing? You know, if we, if we were in like a real like auditorium or something, I'd be like, y'all give it up for Alex. He's like, come on, come on, let's give it up for Alex. Everybody in the in the chat, everybody around the world, everybody that's that's watching right. the recap, let's give it up for Alex. Dude, that boy, that boy cool. Um, but viral content and uh, traditional. I, I, never, I didn't get into, tra into traditional marketing until the outlet. My first company was my dress shoe company, um, my designer dress shoe company that I started in college. And I used viral content, which is kind of organic, uh, organic growth. And I did that through memes uh, and storytelling. So I think that's still very, there's, it's very prevalent right nowadays, you know, for people to use a lot of memes and to hop on trends and, you know, kind of connect them and make it make sense with their brand. Uh, but storytelling definitely helped me grow my dress shoe company from zero to like 90,000 followers. It, like super quick even my personal brand it grew through storytelling and memes and uh, and just video content and so I, I really encourage that i'm just now getting into that more with the outlet and the outlet is going viral a few times and i think really capturing the, the simplest content tends to be the content that goes to viral the, the, the fastest so you don't have to have a videographer a whole media team to capture a viral video it could be a, literally an iphone video that you capture of everybody doing an electric slide at an event and it shows a lot of bliss a lot of joy and you just post that and you put a, you might put a, a certain track behind it or whatever it might be that's trending and that can go viral. Um, so, yeah. And then having your call to actions and your ads and, and everything like that. And then traditional marketing, um, it works a lot. It works really good. That's what I've used for the outlet and uh, it scaled the outlet a lot. So I think having a balance between both and understanding both is good. But if you don't have the budget to uh, invest in traditional marketing, like the billboards, I, you ain't going to see an outlet billboard around, around <laughs> L.A. Show <laughs> you you can't go see that. So you know, being creative uh, again, allow yourself to be creative if you're creative, and um, don't get yourself down if you can't invest a lot into ads because I haven't really invested an extreme amount into it. It's just a daily budget, and I'm always marketing. And I have good content, good good uh, text under that, and good call to actions, and that's really all you need. And put like fifteen dollars, twenty dollars a day, ten dollars a day, five dollars a day. Just start testing it out, 
and then over time you'll learn it and you'll start growing. Uh, you'll see growth for sure. So I love both. One, mixture. one day, man, there's going to be an outlet <laughs> billboard in LA. I'm, I'm sure hey, of it. You know, outlet, it's going to go crazy. We're going to have, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have, you'll see a plane flying, blah, blah, blah. One day it's going to have an outlet on the plane. You're going to be like, wait a minute. Rounds. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. Um, well, Eric, Whitney, Han, thank you so much for giving us this peek behind the curtain of why your events um, consistently sell out. You have, you know, given us so many um, takeaways, things that we can apply to, you know, a variety of businesses. So just really want to thank you, everybody in the chat. Let's send our speakers out with some love. Thank you for hanging with us. Everybody go give them a follow on socials. You can see their information below. Check out their events. Show them some love. Thank you all so much. Pull up. Um, Thanks so much. And yeah, I mean, we're going to do a full recap of today's uh, conversation and all of the key takeaways that I called out and then some. Um, we keep an eye on, on your inboxes. We'll send that to you via email. It's going to be on Eventbrite's blog and um, you'll see access to all of the recordings as well as like summaries by our editors, like I mentioned. Um, Another thing that I really want you all to be aware of is Eventbrite's Reconvene Accelerator program. And um, the Accelerator is Eventbrite's grant program. It's designed to bring your dream events to life. And winners will receive $20,000 and mentorship from the likes of Grammy-nominated artist Judenna, famed chef Sophia Rowe, and uh, mindfulness author Tamara Levitt. So you'll also get specialized workshops with fellow creators like Eric and Whitney and Han, and also Eventbrite experts. So this is um, not an opportunity that you want to pass up. Applications close on June 13th. You only have a few days left to apply. I highly recommend you do. This is an opportunity for you to bring your dream event to life. Um, so just want to thank you all for being here with us today, for engaging with us in the chat. Um, friendly reminder to jump into that survey tab right below me before you head out. We're going to be giving away two $50 gift certificates um, to those of you who fill it out. So uh, we really appreciate that feedback. We want to make these sessions better. And the next session will be coming up on August 31st. It's all going to be all about how to turn your passion into a successful business. So we're going to be back with another group of event creators and entrepreneurs to share their experiences and advice with you. Registrations are open. Go grab your spot today. Finally, if you're sharing anything, don't forget to use that hashtag reconvene. We will share the love on our social channels. And if you have any questions that relate to the Eventbrite platform specifically, you can check out our help center. They'll have all the answers to your technical needs. And of course, the best way to stay in the loop on all of our community programs is to follow Eventbrite's organizer profile on Eventbrite, as well as our social handle at Eventbrite organizers on both Instagram and Facebook. We really want to keep the conversation going, but thank you for hanging with us today and we'll see you next time.
सफल फासले हैं फिर भी मगर जैसे मिलते नहीं किसी दरिया के दो किनारे पास ना फिर भी पास नहीं हमको ये गम रास नहीं शीश की दीवार है जैसे दरिया सारे सहर सारे हैं सोए सोए वक्त के धारे हैं और दिल में कोई कोई सी बात Oh, mm-hmm. 